Hello everyone, before I give the words to our guests, let me briefly explain to you why we are organizing this panel and tell you a little bit um, about who we are and I will also show you some examples as to what made us uh, focus on this subject. As some of you know, Huyang Think uh, Foundation has a democracy lab called ASUS and we run several different projects and we have a project entitled uh, Towards a New Discourse and Dialogue. We have four partners within the within the framework of this uh, project, Granting Foundation plus um, Soci so Social uh, Volunteers Foundation, Sabanji University and um, Support for Life um, Foundation. As the name suggests, uh, we are um, in pursuit of a new discourse and we are trying to lay the foundations for that to happen. And again, within this context, um, we focus on Syrian refugees and hate speech towards uh, Syrian refugees. We we um, focus on those matters and we don't just look at media but we also bring together people coming from different industries such as like media, public sector and civil society um, sector to make sure that this is a pertinent topic on, on our um, agendas and to create a new language, a new discourse for uh, refugees and we have a non-formal training and hopefully we are going to disseminate this um, across the board to increase the impact. We initiated this project in December. We have a series of panels, uh, the first of which is this one. Why did we start off with media? Let me briefly talk about that. Since 2009, Ranting Foundation has been monitoring print uh, press to uh, focus on hate speech discrimination based on ethnicity, uh, nationality, and faith, and so on. Since 2014, we have seen um, a rise in, um, in, in hate speech towards Syrians and uh, the first top three slots uh, have remained the same over the years despite the um, political um, agenda. These groups are subject to hate speech um, and uh, we see Syrians upon this list as well. So this is the um, starting point for our uh, project. Again, very briefly, let me um, tell you some highlights um, as to why we think this is the case in, in, in our country. As you know, Syrian refugees um, are associated with negative perceptions and of course there are other social factors as well, but the media creates um, this negative image or perception of, of the Syrian and this uh, language is reproduced over and over again. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of, um, a lot of um, myths about the Syrians as to how they can go to any university that they like, how they get um, 1,200 lira a month, how they will um, you know, um, become voters uh, come next elections, and many of these um, are actually unfounded. Of course, these are important, but not just these. Um, the syntax used by the, by the media, the titles, the, the, um, the headlines uh, all uh, shape this perception, and also um, citizenship, family life, economy, crime, all of these areas are actually uh, pertinent when we talk about um, Syrian refugees and um, the fact that they are subject to uh, discriminatory language. And also we see a crisis of um, description, wh whether these people are guests, whether they are refugees, whether they are asylum seekers and so on and so forth. And most of the time, um, is certain um, um, uh, words are used to define Syrians, such as fl floods, flooding, um, and sensationalist language is used. And, um, and refugees um, are also associated with economic burden uh, through several different um, words, uh, descriptions, and people are reduced to statistics and numbers. And of course, my ge our guests are going to uh, delve deeper into these uh, topics. Of course, none of this is confined to Syrians, but many other vulnerable um, groups and communities as well. So um, I will just give you a couple of brief examples, some news uh, clippings uh, from some Turkish newspapers. This headline reads, Syrians cause unemployment. Um, a local newspaper in, in Izmir um, 
sur manşette şunu diyor. And here's what, what, what it says. Uh, Syrians cause uh, an increase in rents and uh, a rise in unemployment. Um, it looks like a legit uh, news article, but actually uh, the, this news article um, is refuted by economists. And this article is trying to create a perception. And this is uh, portrayed as, as facts. Another example, Syrians uh, caused a hike in rents uh, from Shamnufa Kent uh, local daily. And again, um, um, a journalist uh, goes to a merchant in Shamnufa and this person's views are uh, printed here as, as facts. There are two examples regarding women. Um, we come across this quite often and we call this um, Double, double discrimination because women are discriminated against not just because they're refugees but because they're also women. This in this news article, um, this is quite direct actually, um, and um, there isn't much to be said about this. Um, this writer uh, claims that Syrian uh, women are after Turkish men, are they um, in pursuit of Turkish men just like Russian women uh, were in pursuit of um, Turkish men way back when USSR um, uh, collapsed and Syrian women are labeled as immoral and potential uh, home wreckers. Yet another layer, uh, Syrian spouse um, engages in um, um, in, in, in plot how this uh, Syrian spouse ran away with gold and other gifts given to the couple. Um, the person who is portrayed as the victim uh, says uh, that they lost 18,000 lira, including the fee paid to the intermediary, i.e. the person who found the bride for the groom in this example. So this is human trafficking and this is not even mentioned in the news article. These are a couple of examples from social media. Um, on social media also we see uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a tough stance on, on Syrians. Here are a couple of examples. All of these Syrians should be put on a des de deserted island. All of these uh, Syrians must be expelled from the motherland. We are fed up with the Syrian uh, law lives and wh wh what they do to us on a daily basis. And finally, um, over-representation. Um, what we call overrepresentation, um, and how Syrians are um, associated with crime, and um, how they're always um, portrayed as the source of the blame for daily ills that we experience. Here's a collage of different news clippings, uh, Syrian murders, uh, Syrian um, right wreaks havoc. Uh, and so in short, what I'm trying to say is regardless of their association with, with the crime, uh, the, their identity is put to the foreground, like um, harassment, murder, it's as if these are a natural extension of being Syrian. And this is the perception that they're trying to uh, create. So I'll just stop here. Um, we are um, focusing on conventional media as well as uh, new media, and I think, and we think that they are uh, powerful. And I think we need to adopt a rights-based approach to uh, create uh, better relations between different communities. That's why we invited um, researchers and journalists and communication experts to come and talk to us here today. We would like to thank them very much for being with us today. And thank you for your participation as well. Teşekkürler Gamze. Benim adım Metin Çorabatır. Thank you Gamze. My name is Metin Çorabatır. I also come from a journalism background. I worked as a as a journalist uh, for years, and then in 1995 uh, I was the press um, spokesman at the UNHCR. And in 2013. Um, because of the fact that I, I um, became senior, I was, I was um, uh, made to um, retire and with a couple of friends we set up a uh, foundation, um, Asylum and Refugee Studies uh, Foundation. So since then we have been focusing on research and we have been focusing on operational projects as well. Um, I would like to thank the Haranting Foundation very much and also um, thank the uh, project, um, the directors, uh, Gamze, Özge, and Veli Aksoy, Gülşay Akın, um, as well as Elçin Çalıkıyak.
Rangers uh, for making this event possible and for all the hard work that they have been engaged in. They're doing a marvelous job, um, and I apologize if I have mispronounced your names, but um, at this panel we're going to talk about media and refugees' rights-based approach in journalism good practices. This is the title of our panel, and I think we are going to, uh, just like you said, Gam Gamze, focus on uh, some of the most important um, topics um, regarding this issue. Now, we are joined by some very honorable guests. Uh, two of our friends came from abroad and for long years they have been working on media, um, hate speech. Um, let me briefly um, introduce them to you. Um, we have Mike Jamson joining us. Um, he's a journalist, writer, trainer since 1996. Um, he, he has been focusing on journalism, ethics, um, and he's been the uh, director of Media Rise. He's taught at many different universities, um, and he is also um, a part of the International Federation of Journalists and the Media Diversity Institute, and he has worked in more than 40 countries, and uh, he focuses on media accountability, children's rights, reporting about refugees, coverage of suicide and censorship. He serves on the Ethics Council of the, of the um, National Union of Journalists in the UK and Ireland and, and is a fellow of the Lithuanian National Institute for Social Integration and he is also an advisor uh, to the um, Ethical Journalism Network. To my left, we have um, Nadia Pallardi, and she's with Community Media Forum Europe, um, and she's a project manager um, in that institution. And um, between 2016 or 2018, uh, she was involved in the Media Against Hate project, and um, uh, New Neighbors. Um, is the name of the new project that uh, she's in charge of uh, between 2019-2020. She's uh, been appointed as an independent expert and a rapporteur to the Council of Europe, a Committee of Experts on Quality Journalism in the Digital Age since 2018. Nadia is a member of the Board of Swiss Foundation for Radio and Culture, headquartered in Bern, uh, supporting radi radio creativity through programs, trainings, productions, competitions, cultural events, um, projects and events in the, in the field of um, radio um, broadcasting. Also we have Ekim Karaca from Turkey and he's a journalist. He is with Bianet. Uh, he is the core editorial director of that uh, news network. He has been working at Bianet since 2012. Between 06 uh, 07, uh, he worked at Nocta magazine, and from 08 to 011 um, at Actual uh, magazine as a reporter. He, he graduated from Media and Communication Systems Department of Big University in 04. Um, and also, let me tell you uh, very briefly uh, that, yes, before this panel, actually, we talked amongst ourselves. Mike um, um, is going to speak first because he has a broader view. And then I'm going to give the word to uh, Madam Baladi. Um, and he, she is um, um, going to um, give us a presentation. And then I will give the word to Ekin. Uh, from Turkey, seeing as he is from Turkey, after these presentations in the second round, um, I will ask them some questions, and finally, we are going to receive your questions as well. So we have two hours in total. Um, we might be a little bit late. I will do my best not to um, not to um, go beyond our time limits because I have a plan to catch as well. So. Let me say this from the um, outset. So, we're in 2019, as you know, the government um, announced this year as the year of um, harmonization um, for Syrians and for other um, um, refugees that require international protection. So this is the year of harmonization. And as you know, in Turkey, there are more than 4 million uh, registered um, refugees. 
I decided to use the word refugee um, because uh, I care about the, their um, conditions uh, rather than um, the, the words or descriptions used by governments and states. As Gamze has said, there is a mix-up of terminology when we talk about refugees. Um, everyone um, talks about Syrians, they are called immigrants, Syrians, um, those under temporary protect, pr protection. There is a long list uh, of names uh, ascribed to these people. But the only thing that we and also in Europe there is a lot of debate um, which is rather different uh, than what we have in Turkey. These people are refugees. When you call them, when you call them immigrants or when you call them Syrians, uh, when you call them by your nationality, there are certain legal ramifications that are different. That's why our politicians, um, you know, you know, say that Syrians will go back and so on and so forth. But if we recognize that these people are refugees, then we need to also ask the question as to why these people came to Turkey uh, in the first place and how they will go back to their homeland. Like I said, there is a lot of confusion about the uh, uh, phraseology used around Syrians. But let me let me give you another example um, about Syrian refugees. Um, our youngsters um, 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 uh, fall um, as martyrs in, in Syria, whereas the Syrians are having fun in Taksim and swimming on the beaches in Turkey. So uh, these are quite illogical things said about uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. But of course, this problem is not confined to Turkey, all across the world, especially in the, in the times that we're living in, because of the discourse used by politicians. This language is uh, sort of aggravated. So I'd like to give the word to Mike uh, to um, kickstart the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, listening to, to Gamzee, it seems to me that um, your press has been learning a lot of lessons from the British press um, because this is, well, I'll be telling you a bit about that. Um, I, I had the pleasure of being invited to visit the Hrant Dink Memorial Museum um, at the old Agos offices just now. And I just thought, I, if, I, if I may, I would begin by just telling you about one of our journalists, an Irish journalist, a young woman called Lara McKee, who was shot dead on the 19th of April 2019 while she was covering a story. We've all got our martyrs, and uh, it's important to remember them. Uh, a memorial has been set up for Lyra as well. She was a very young, up-and-coming journalist who was simply covering an incident in Derry in Northern Ireland when she was shot in the head. So I just wanted to bring her to the, to the meeting. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be invited here, and I just hope that what I've got to say adds something to the party. Um, but I've just come from an event elsewhere, which I'll mention, which made me rethink what I was going to say to you. So I just hope that it works. But I want to begin by explaining a little bit about who I am. Um, the MediaWise Trust... I'm oh, sorry. Sorry? Does that make any difference? <laughs> Was I just talking to myself? Or? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, where was I? Yes. The MediaWise Trust, I've been a journalist for about 45 years, um, but since 1996 I've been running the MediaWise Trust, which was set up by people whose lives had been wrecked by bad journalism. And what we did was um, we tried to find ways of um, helping them to gain redress. Sometimes this meant going to court, but more often it meant trying to explain the media to them, trying to talk to journalists and editors or going to the regulators. And out of that, we began to learn lessons as journalists about how to improve things. So we saw all sorts of trends developing and then we began to work on how to improve journalism in those areas. And that's why we ended up at one point concentrating on refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and we have what I think is a very interesting motto, which is that press freedom is a responsibility exercised by journalists on behalf of the public. 
So it doesn't belong to the editors. It doesn't belong to the proprietors. It doesn't belong to us as journalists. It's something that we have for other people. It's better. All right, okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's our raison d'etre. And these, I could show you about three or four hours worth of headlines from Britain, but here's just a few ideas, just a selection of front pages. Um, newspapers um, talking about uh, against Muslims. We're, we're very good on Islamophobia in the British press. Um, here's just one newspaper, a selection um, of their front pages attacking migrants. Here's another one, um, and here's another one. And we could go on like this for ever and a day. Um, but this is really the theme of what I want to say. Now, it may seem a very odd way to start, um, but last week I was chairing, uh, last Friday, I was chairing a session at a conference called Perceptions of Migration in Lithuania. And this was the end of a nine-month project to try and get young people, young activists and young journalists to think about ways of challenging hate speech and finding new ways of telling the migration story. And I'll come back to that later. But I also wanted to say that many years ago, um, I became friends with some Kurds and some Armenians. I had no idea that they were Kurdish or Armenian at the time. And had they told me, I probably wouldn't have known what it meant. But over the years, I've got to know their backstory and they've become very much a part of my life. Um, and it's perhaps one of the reasons why I've never visited Turkey before because of the stories that I've heard from them. But then I started meeting Turkish journalists who are now in exile and I can see how it all fits together. Um, so if you deprive people of your human rights and your right to freedom of expression, then you dehumanize people. At the same time, it's the human relationships that bind us together. And that can only come if we talk to each other and show that we're interested in talking to each other. So one of my Armenian friends is godmother to my oldest son. And just earlier this year, I was her guest at the reception given by the mayor of Paris, um, commemorating the Armenian genocide. And I'm currently translating her father's remarkable autobiography despite or perhaps because of his experience as a child in the Syrian desert, um, he would later join the French resistance and survive years in prison under the Nazis. Um, so these human stories are the things that have changed my life in many ways. And I've learned many different stories from some of the journalists I've met um, who are living in exile over the last 20 years. And I've just... It's interesting to look at the countries they've come from. Afghanistan. I have an Afghani, young Afghani guy living in my house at the moment. Algeria, Armenia, Belarus, Burundi, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Sudan, Syria, Turkey, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. These are all people who've been driven out of their countries for doing their jobs as journalists and have ended up in the UK. And when they came there, they were horrified by what they saw in the press. And some of them joined forces with us, and we began to investigate some of the stories and expose them, or try to expose them. <coughs> some of the more extraordinary stories, for instance, was that um, asylum seekers steal um, the swans in British parks. Swans in Britain belong to the Queen. It's a very peculiar thing. Um, nobody's quite understood why. Um, but this was a complete false story, but it's one that happens, reappears almost every year, that um, they steal donkeys from the parks to eat them, that the reason there are no fish in the rivers in Britain is not to do with pollution, but because asylum seekers keep fishing them. In Britain, people fish just as a sort of hobby to get away, mostly men, to get away from home, and they sit by the river all day, catch fish, and then throw them back in. Most countries, you eat fish when you catch them. But... Apparently, we can't fish anymore because the asylum seekers have taken all the fish. And one of the more extraordinary ones was that some Al-Qaeda operatives from Lithuania, good Catholic country, um, 
were involved in a plot to kill the Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Totally false nonsense, um, but very useful for selling newspapers. And another story showing that 1.6 million Roma were about to enter Britain. And we used journalistic techniques to prove that these were wrong. But we also discovered that one of the newspaper proprietors had realised that if he put these stories on the front page, he sold more newspapers, and that was his business. Uh, that was his business model. And his journalist took him to the regulator and said, this is unethical, uh, we shouldn't have our stories changed and, and used in this way. And the regulator said, you have an industrial issue here, nothing to do with us. And the Society of Editors said, this is an ethical question, and the ethics of what goes into a newspaper um, is down to the editor and not to the staff. Um, <coughs> so we had to think about, well, how, how can we affect this from outside? And we realised that at a national level, journalists are very often dealing with what politicians say and what statistics say, and they very rarely actually meet the people they're writing about. Um, so they respond to the dog whistling of the, of the politicians and then that translates down throughout the media. Um, so what we did is we, we got exiled journalists because they already had a way in as colleagues to be listened to and believed. And we, we got them together in London and invited the press to come and meet them. Um, and as a result, we saw a little bit of a change um, and some of them, we, we produced a directory of exiled journalists, which I've got here, it's a bit old, and we sent this to every media outlet and said, here are people who want to work in the media and here's their stories, why don't you use them? And some of them did get work that way. But we, we realised that we need to do more of this sort of thing at a local level. So we used to organise little evening gatherings with maybe some drinks or some uh, um, sweet meats, and invited refugees and their supporters and local editors and journalists to just come and meet and talk. And the refugees could say what they thought about the coverage, and the, the newspapers very often said, well, we don't know how to contact you. But once they sat down and talked to people, they discovered what fantastic stories they might be getting out of refugees completely changed their sort of attitude. And what we began to see, it was very interesting, over a period of time, was that local newspapers, because there's a local paper in every town, became very positive about exiled, uh, not just about exiled journalists, but about refugees. And where they saw there was local support, they would then find that the local MP was supporting them. So you, you, know, you began to start from the bottom upwards to change some of the political attitudes. <coughs> um, and uh, one of the, th the other things that we did was we made a little film where exiled journalists talked about why they were here in Britain and what they felt about the coverage, but more importantly, what impact it had on their lives, how it affected the way people responded to them. Uh, and this was, we've distributed this, and it's still a very useful debating point, because it makes people think. Some of the stuff, there's one young um, um, Syrian guy who was tortured um, maybe 20 odd years ago, um, and his story is very, very powerful. And it makes people realize that these you know, there are human stories that need to be told. Because if you don't have a voice, if you can't be heard, what happens is you become very frustrated, you become very angry. I have a young um, uh, Algerian guy at the moment who, who's absolutely furious with the British state, and understandably, but it's not going to get him anywhere because he's trying to get his asylum claim through. But it's interesting, it's an example of this sense of sort of powerlessness and the frustration that that builds up. And it becomes even worse if the very people you think would support you, the press, maybe politicians, um, are just spouting lies. I mean, stuff they know is not true and stuff which is designed to make you feel um, even worse about yourself, to make you feel guilty 
for actually being there. Um, now, what's interesting too is that if you look in, in the research in, in the Lithuanian project, which covered seven countries, uh, was very much the same, that much of the, of the hate speech is coming directly from politicians. And then it cascades down and you hear it then in the pubs and clubs and on the, on the street. <coughs> so how are we going to sort of break through that? Well, one of the experiments in the, in the Lithuanian project was a thing called Migrants Library. Do you know the, the living library technique? Do you know about this? So we sort of set up situations in Budapest and then in, in, in Vilnius where people could come and meet the stereotypes. So you go along and you pick up a stereotype um, and then you find there's a real person there and you can talk about their lives. And it makes a big difference, this whole idea of making the human um, contact. Um, and this, this project had been going on for about nine months and last Friday we invited three exiled journalists, one from Syria, one from Iran, one from Bosnia, to respond, to say, well, what do you think about the way these young people are trying to change attitudes? And they had some quite powerful things to say. One of them said, change the narrative and reframe the debate. Talk about the responsibilities of the state and not saying that refugees are a burden. It's interesting, the language that Kamsi talked about. Try and avoid the blame culture which makes refugees guilty just for being refugees. See those who seek sanctuary for who they are, their skills, their anxieties, and their aspirations. They're human beings who've lost everything and need care and attention. Listen to their voices and appreciate why they've become homeless and stateless through no fault of their own. Another said, Western Europe cannot lecture the world about human rights while letting people die at their borders. She is very passionate about this. Now, you have four million refugees here, I understand. Um, Fortress Europe claims that it's got a migration crisis. Um, but we worked out that it has one refugee for every two of its one of its 10 million square kilometers so there's one refugee for every two square kilometers but Lebanon which has only got ten and a half square kilometers and a population of six million has got 20 refugees per square kilometer so that's 40 times more but we don't hear very much certainly in the Western European media about the migration crisis in Lebanon. Somebody else said there, it's important to explain difference by letting people speak. Encouraging the victims of proxy wars and environmental degradation to speak out is the first step towards inclusivity and understanding. To ignore their stories is to pretend they do not exist and it allows the far right to set the political agenda and peddle their poison without antidote. Another one said, I'm a Palestinian. I was born a refugee. I was brought up in Syria, but my family were not allowed to own a house and we couldn't have Syrian passports. But when the war started and I escaped to Turkey, I was told to go back to Syria because Turkey didn't accept Palestinian refugees. I slept in the field that night. And this is interesting because we seldom see any analysis of why people have gone on the road. There was a Zimbabwean at the conference, and he said, no African country manufactures guns, so why isn't the media asking questions about where the weapons that come from that are fueling so many of the conflicts that are sending thousands across borders in search of sanctuary? It's a good question. I've never, ever seen that asked in the British media, even though, of course, the British arms trade is one of the most profitable um, in the world. And why aren't jour journalists focusing on the role of their own governments and industries in these proxy wars? I once interviewed a Turkish woman some time ago now, and she explained that she'd had to leave her home here in Turkey because of the construction of a dam. I can't remember the details now. And she couldn't understand why people like her were being vilified for having come to Britain, but nobody 
was doing anything about the fact that British investors were financing the dam. And she said, why aren't people out on the streets in the city of London asking those sorts of questions? Again, I couldn't really answer that. So we, uh, we uh, began to investigate these sorts of stories. We tried to show how, how, how foolish and dangerous they were. <coughs> but those stories have become commonplace. That you're using exactly the same imagery and language here about Syrians as we've been using. And what we discovered in this, uh, in this project was the same is true all over Europe. Um, and these stories now become amplified through social media. And I don't think that we can use social media to undermine them. I mean, it's much too difficult. What we really need is some really solid investigative journalists, and it's got to be independent. And the big problem right now is most of the newspapers in most of Europe are either very commercial concerns or they're linked to political parties. And they're the two main barriers to the truth really coming out because industry, the industry itself, is much more interested, as we've seen, in making money than sometimes in telling the truth. Um, one of the things, for instance, that created the whole Brexit nonsense in Britain at the moment um, was a series of stories put out mostly through social media but amplified at a local level to say the European Union is actually a German plot that having lost two world wars, they found a new way of enslaving Europe. The other story that was put out was that um, actually Turkey had secretly been given permission to join the European Union and that that means that Islam would take over Christian Europe. So these were stories that were being put out by politicians at a local level, at a national level, amplified in the press and has resulted in, as I say, in the nonsense that is Brexit. <coughs> um, I've been asked to, to try and cut this down, but it's quite difficult. Um, if you I will, I will try. Three minutes. Sorry three minutes, yeah. right. Um, well, I'm, where I'm coming to is both the point that, first of all, we need to listen to voices. Secondly, we need to get more diversity inside newsrooms, because if you've got people who understand, who've had the experience, who know what it's like, and who know where to go and who to talk to, it makes a huge difference. Um, I find that more and more difficult to achieve. Um, so there's much more opportunities now, perhaps, for more truly independent um, journalism, independent newspapers which are not part of large corporations. Um, in Germany, one of the things that came out, I'm proud to say there were links to the work we've been doing with our Exile Journalist Network, they set up a thing called the, the new, du new German Media Makers, where people from ethnic backgrounds in, in uh, Germany have been helping to train and get um, young exiled journalists into the media. Um, they were the two of the people we had at the conference last week had come through that scheme. And in France, there's a thing called La Maison des Journalistes, where they provide succor and a home for six months to exiled journalists, um, puts them back in touch with their families, teaches them about the local media scene, gives them an opportunity to settle. Um, and that's the sort of, if you like, comfort that's needed. Um, we had a civic meeting in Bristol, my city, uh, last week, the week before last. Um, and there was an interesting comment made by two Syrian sisters who came, who were in my discussion group. And they had a completely different attitude to most of the asylum seekers that I've worked with over the years. And it was extremely positive. Now, why was this? Well, first of all, they had been met off the plane when they came to Britain by a group of women from the city. So they knew they were coming. They even knew their names. They took them to the accommodation that had been provided for them, and they looked after them. They welcomed them to the city. So they had a completely different attitude. They were very positive. They couldn't understand why people were complaining. Um, 
these two women were wearing hijab, so they could have expected some sort of a reaction, um, but they didn't. Why? Because they'd been that human contact and because they'd been welcomed. It was a very different sort of uh, uh, an experience, a very different sort of attitude. <coughs> um, and there's one last point I think that I wanted to make. Um, which sort of, sort of undoes some of the things I've been saying. But of course, one of the reasons why people were willing to welcome the, the Syrian refugees in Britain, as they did during the Balkan Wars 20 years ago, is because actually the media had given quite a lot of attention to the bombardment of Aleppo and Homs and, um, and so forth, and, and Idlib in particular just recently. So people didn't know about it. So it's a quite a good example that where the media do their job properly and we do get to hear, for whatever reason, um, why people are fleeing whatever it is, whether it's a war, whether it's an environmental catastrophe, then at least there's understanding when they arrive. And if there's understanding and people can talk about what it is that's driven them there, we begin to break down some of the barriers and we begin to break through the damage that's done by hate speech. So that's a very swift completion. So you've missed lots of gems because this man insists <laughs> that I lose my right to freedom of expression. <laughs> I'm sorry, my intention was not that, but you have sorry. to <laughs> uh, make it a bit short. Thank you very much with, with this very uh, enlightened uh, comments. And now I'm turning to uh, Nadia. Uh, could you please, again, with some time limits, as we discussed earlier, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> My name is Nadia Bellardi. I've been already introduced by Metin. I'm Italian. I live in Switzerland, which is a country that has almost 30% of its population made up by foreigners, especially children of um, second and third generation immigrants who um, often still do not have the passport, so do not have the right to vote. So it's an interesting example because they um, have a strong democratic uh, culture, but in fact uh, almost a fourth of the population, of Swiss population, does not have the right to vote. So there are a lot of contradictions there. I'm here representing an organization called Community Media Forum Europe, uh, CMFE that um, represents uh, so-called third sector media, so non-profit media, which um, is called a little bit different in a lot of countries, but um, we call it community media to give it um, a sort of general um, definition. I will talk about that a little bit more. And I worked um, in Zurich in Switzerland for um, around five years at a local community radio station that um, has been existing for 35 years and broadcasts in uh, more than 20 languages because it was in fact um, people from the various migrant communities in Switzerland that came to this radio station to make programs in their own language and they started by um, producing programs, for example, for the Italian community to explain things like um, how do I sign up my kids to school, how do I get a health insurance, and then from then on uh, the programs also became um, about news and information and the work I was doing at the radio was to try and get all of these different communities to actually work together and use also the local language, which in the case of Zurich is German, and produce multilingual programs so that it was not just the language of their own community, but it was a way of creating dialogue and intercultural exchange. And this was very helpful because um, it was also giving a fuller picture and it was allowing, uh, allowing people within the radio to get to know one another. So I'm going to refer to some of these examples to talk about um, hate speech against migrants. And um, I will start off by making a very general observation about the topic of migration and um, trying to um, capture the complexity of the migration phenomenon. So 
Migration has been part of the history of humankind since the first day that our species has walked on Earth, and um, it is by no means a crisis. Um, a crisis, by definition, is the worsening of a problem, but migration itself is not a problem. It's a human right, and it's actually a very natural phenomenon. Migration is a result of a problem, and the problems are war, inequality, homophobia, floods. Those are the problems, not migration. Migration is a solution to those problems. So if we, um, as journalists, as communicators, as media makers, approach the topic from this angle, then probably um, also the coverage and the articles that would come out uh, would take a different perspective, and they would as has been said before, um, look behind the scenes and try and explain why are people moving and also try and present that as a natural phenomenon. Obviously, um, refugees are a specific legal category of migrants and it's not for journalists or for public opinion to define who is what. I mean, it's, it's a legal status, but I think it's important um, to create a culture of um, welcoming and acceptance regardless of legal categories because we are also seeing a lot of hierarchies in terms of good migrants, um, less good migrants. Um, no, we don't want those migrants at all. I, you know, um, I see that a lot in, you know, the way that also sometimes, um, um, you know, certain instruments are developed for journalists to choose words that can also have a sort of, you know, um, backfiring effect. Um, whenever we talk about hate speech, I think it's important to frame um, our discussion within Article 10 because um, the role of the media, despite all of its mistakes <laughs> and all of its issues, is crucial in providing a platform for complex issues to be presented to the public. And the European Court of Human Rights has consistently underlined the vital role of the media as a public watchdog. They help to impart information and ideas on matters of public interest, which the public has a right to receive. And um, the restrictions of these freedoms, which are um, foreseen by Article 10, have to be prescribed by law and um, are necessary only in very limited cases. So when we try to define hate speech, it becomes a little bit complicated and there is always a delicate balance to be made. Um, how far can we go? Where does freedom of expression stop? Where does hate speech begin? When we worked in the project Media Against Hate together with Article 19, we referred to a, defini to a definition which they had um, developed um, earlier on, and you can see on the screen the categories that are included, um, and amongst them you also have migrant and um, refugee status. At the same time, online hate speech in particular is a very complex phenomenon, and um, I think that only a collective commitment at the educational level will help us to overcome it. Um, and I still am an optimist in the sense that I still think that we need to keep the freedom of expression um, angle um, in front of us, uh, even when we are um, addressing these issues. Coming back quickly to the Council of Europe, and the Council of Europe is particularly relevant in this context because um, it has 47 member states, Turkey is one of them, so it represents um, human rights in Europe from Portugal to Russia. So already in 1997, the Council of Europe had identified that um, hate speech, and in particular already then online hate, was um, a problem. But they also recognized that um, media were most often, as um, was um, said previously, media were reproducing political discourse and hateful speech. And so they um, adopted a recommendation that very clearly puts um, the responsibility on politicians to refrain from any types of um, speech that could spread or promote hatred 
xenophobia, anti-Semitism, or other forms of discrimination or intolerance. So um, I think that this recommendation applies now more than ever, especially in European Union member states, where we see that um, political campaigns are um, being run um, specifically with this type of discourse. And these are recommendations and documents that the European Court of Human Rights um, uses in its judgments and that we as citizens of Council of Europe member states have the right to use as well in our work and, and to refer to them whenever it makes sense. Um, the recently adopted Global Compact of the United Nations um, on Migration also mentions the role of the media in um, promoting um, a positive public discourse about migration and refugees. And it also very clearly says that the media has the responsibility to avoid um, reporting things that could lead to hate speech. And it even goes as far as saying that public funding should be taken away um, from media, which is not um, um, responding, I mean, with, you know, media which is not um, um, uh, adopting these, these codes of conduct. So anything that promotes intolerance should not be funded by public funds. And um, the Global Compact has a lot of other very useful recommendations. Um, it very clearly penalizes hate crimes and it also tries to engage with migrants, with diaspora communities to um, help them also um, detect and prevent incidents of racism and attacks because um, very often these incidents are not reported because people don't know how and where um, to report them. They don't know um, that they have the right and, and the duty to report them. So um, these are other activities um, not directly media related. But um, in terms of the role of the media, so um, the Council of Europe views the media, as I was saying, um, as important facilitators of public debate. And um, they wanted to investigate how the media worked um, in the context of what became known um, as the refugee crisis. So um, they commissioned a report to the London School of Economics, um, which is available online. I will show you later where you can download it. Um, and they found um, out um, what we all know, actually, <laughs> which um, was that um, the European press played um, a role in framing the events as a crisis, that um, the language used and the limited perspective um, contributed to negative and to hostile attitudes amongst the public towards newcomers. And, um, that refugees and migrants themselves were given very limited opportunities to speak directly of their own experiences and um, and that, you know, in general, th this research by the London School of Economics looked at eight countries and looked mainly at press. But um, it, you know, it, it sort of confirms also what um, you have been reporting about Turkey. There is a second study called Spaces of Inclusion, where I was directly involved. And here, we took a different perspective. We said, let's look at the communication needs of migrants and refugees. Um, and the right to information is one of those needs, because if somebody comes um, to a foreign country and there is no information available in a language that he or she understands, um, then they are not able to um, have um, their right of freedom of expression and freedom of information. So community media, because of these multilingual programs, have been um, one of the few media that have actually filled this gap. So in this study, we looked at um, what um, can community media offer to especially recently arrived refugees and migrants. We also found that often um, community media were the first point of contact for exiled journalists who wanted to continue their profession but um, didn't know the local language and um, couldn't get a job <laughs> paid, couldn't get a paid job, but at least they could work as voluntary producers, voluntary radio journalists in community media and still keep up 
their work. So, um, and, and of course, we know that also migrants, including second and third generation, are still totally underrepresented in professional media, which is why associations like the um, Neue Deutsche Medienmacher, the New German Media Makers, have um, uh, been created to promote um, inclusion and diversity in professional media. Because I'm speaking about community media, I want to give you just a very, very brief overview of, um, so what are they? Um, as I was saying, we try to define them as third media sector, nonprofit and independent. We did um, a sort of survey um, already certain, uh, a certain number of years ago and um, counted um, around 2,300 community radios and more than 500 community TVs in Council of Europe member states. UNESCO recognizes community media um, and recognizes that they fulfill functions that are not fulfilled by public service or commercial or social media, but despite of this, there is a total lack of legal framework, funding, recognition um, in most countries, um, in most Council of Europe member countries. And um, what they do um, is obviously, I mean, they provide media content, alternative content, a lot of cultural and linguistic diversity. Training is a very big component. So um, in, in a local community radio, you will get um, technical editorial and ethical journalism training, obviously at a basic level. The aim is not to um, uh, produce professional journalists, but a lot of these people later than may decide also to um, embark on a career. So I want to give you some of the main findings of the Spaces of Inclusion report and then maybe three case studies and then I think I will stop and um, have my colleague Ekin speak and then if you want I can still have some other slides on international projects but just also to respect the time that we have allocated. So the Spaces of Inclusion report found that um, Community media were giving refugees the opportunity to be active as producers, as audience, and not just as objects in media content. Also that um, they obviously, I mean, had um, a position for self-representation. So occupying a position in the mainstream discourse and um, telling those stories that are not told in first, um, in, in first person. So um, not by having um, a mediator in between, but by being one's own voice. So obviously fulfilling this human right to freedom of expression. And um, another important element was um, the multilingual component. So people could access information in a lot of different languages and this was really filling a gap that was very, very strong, in particular for newly arrived refugees. Um, this also meant that they were being recognized as a legitimate part of the audience, because um, most of the time people um, are not concerned with migrants and refugees as an audience. Uh, professional media is, is not concerned with that. I mean, in the times when a lot of Italians and, and, and Southern Europeans were um, immigrating to Germany, the German public service had the sort of, you know, the one hour of Italian um, information program, the one hour in Spanish, the one hour in Turkish, the one hour in Portuguese, and then they stopped that because they said, oh, we don't need it anymore. These people are integrated. They speak German now. But, um, but people travel, I mean, people come and go, and um, the local language is not something that they learn um, necessarily right away. And we also have a lot of minority languages around um, Europe. And also through the work in community media, um, there was a very important role with um, formal and informal networks, meaning that people also had opportunities to get to know other people because of the work they were doing at the community radio and um, also get a job or, um, you know, get an apartment, make new friends. But um, it was <laughs> small but really important steps um, on a path of being, again, 
a whole person and not just someone with a label on his back or her back. So not just being a refugee or a migrant, being a person. My friend, uh, her boyfriend, um, you know, someone who used to be a teacher and so on. So to show you um, some concrete examples, the first one is from Vienna. It's from Octo TV, which is a community television that was established in 2005. It involves around 500 volunteer producers. The program called Indimage started um, around two years ago, if I remember correctly, yes, 2017. And it actually started from an initiative um, similar to what Mike was talking about. It's called Join Media. It's the sort of Austrian <laughs> equivalent of a network for exiled journalists. And they um, started producing this monthly magazine to tell stories from their perspective, but not only from their perspective. I mean, um, they started broadcasting stories um, on all sorts of topics, cultural topics, integration topics, music, um, how they were getting to know Vienna, what they would have liked people from Vienna to know about their um, countries of origins. And, and most of the producers are, are either from Syria or from Iraq. And, um, and the show is still going on and I think it's also available online. Another program is in Luxembourg. It's called Salam Show. And um, it was Lama who had to flee from Homs um, and who is now a student in Luxembourg who had the idea to say, um, my God, I mean, people here, they really know nothing about my country. <laughs> I mean, they really, they have no clue. So she started making this radio program to, um, you know, to talk about her experience, her background, but also to explain in Arabic to newly arrived asylum seekers how things work in Luxembourg. And so this is actually the very first program that exists in Luxembourg um, in, in both English and Arabic. And Ahab, who is on the photo, he used to be a teacher in Damascus. He joined, he's now co-hosting the show. And he had the same, um, the same aim. He said, um, you know, people associate Syrian society with um, maybe three words or three stereotypes, and there is just so much more that, you know, that would be interesting for them to know. And so let's, you know, let's bring it out to them. And, and then I'm finished. I just, one more slide and then I will stop. So um, anyway, so this is what they do. Um, and then the third example um, is, from Vienna again, and it's from Radio Orange, which is the, one of the biggest community radios in Europe. And it's a program called New Life in Vienna. It's again, um, a multilingual program. Um, I didn't put those information there, but here you just have a sort of overview of the radio itself, which is publicly funded. This is important. It's funded by the city of Vienna and also by a fraction of the Austrian radio and TV license. Because in Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, community media are seen as complementary to public service and private commercial media. And so they get funded with public funds for fulfilling those complementary <coughs> functions. And giving access to language minorities and minority communities is one of those functions, besides providing training and providing a meeting place and so on. So I think I will stop here so that um, I don't take up all of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Uh, so both our speakers talked about uh, some very important topics. They talked about the import importance of getting to know one another and representation. And they gave us some great examples as well. Now let's go back to Turkey. We're going to hear from Ekim Karaca. So he's going to tell us about what's going on in Turkey. Um, so what would you like to say? Any good examples? Not, not, not really. What would you like to say? And how do you see the future in Turkey? Thank you. Well, let's take a look at what has been going on recently. Well, hello everyone, by the way. Uh, last Saturday evening, in Küçük Çek Çekmece district of Istanbul, um, this event broke out. Syrians um, molested a girl uh, was the news. 
when we looked at the uh, news story, um, it, first it was all over Twitter, on social media, how Syrians molested a small girl in, in Beyrutuzu. And then, right after this, uh, we started uh, reading this in many um, news outlets on social media. There was a lot of backlash. How Syrians molested a child and how um, people took to the streets in Ikitelli. Um, you know, this is what happened and so on and so forth. There were so many news articles, like I said, on the, on the internet. And politicians... Um, They use a very um, strong language in Turkey, and I think that was instrumental as well. And this reflects on the media, on, on social media as well, because these two are intertwined um, from a populistic uh, point of view. And um, it was almost like the Istanbul pogrom. Um, and, you know, we remember what the media uh, and the role the media played at the time. Um, so, talking about social media, online news outlets, uh, yes, they care about clicks, um, and they have an impact on one another. Um, most of the time, they, they're a bad influence on, on one another, and I think that's something that needs to be reckoned with. And as we all know, uh, there are some troll accounts, um, some fake accounts that um, um, try to always increase the number of their followers, and these accounts um, posted things about uh, this uh, supposed incident in, in Ikitali, in Istanbul, and this had a huge impact on the entire provocation. And to get more clicks, to, to get more mentions or retweets, um, the language that they use is really, truly deplorable that night. Uh, here's a tweet that they sent. Um, one of the molesters uh, are killed, it says, um, and it got a lot of interaction, but it wasn't true. And similarly, on social media, like I said, they use this language uh, just to increase their um, clicks. And many, many uh, news outlets, be they small or large, also use these news. They know that this will get them clicks, and that's uh, how they make money out of Google Ads or they have other motives as well. So, actually, um, social media and conventional media must be, um, um, must be uh, viewed from the same lens. Um, this professor um, used even this hashtag that says, um, that, that orders Syrians to go back home, and um, this was featured in Bionet as well. And this is uh, like a common discourse that many people coming from different walks of life use. We are the majority, um, we are right, uh, we belong here, that's the discourse that many people use. So at this point, how, how should we react as people who claim to be rights-based um, or rights-oriented as BNET, our news network, news organization? What sort of an attitude um, do we exhibit? First of all, the perpetrator, or the supposed perpetrator, uh, the molester, the attacker, their language, their faith, um, lack of faith, uh, should not really interest us. I mean, if someone commits a crime, they're a criminal, regardless of their identity, regardless of their ethnicity, religion, race, and so on and so forth. I don't think that that is right, a rights-based approach. However, if the um, victim uh, falls uh, victim because of their identity, their faith, the lack of um, faith, and so on and so forth, that's the one thing that should really interest us. We need to be supporting the um, underdog. But unfortunately, when we look at the um, prevalent language in media, we see that the, the, whoever the weakest is actually targeted, if they're the perpetrator or if they are claimed to be the perpetrator, uh, then uh, their identity is actually highlighted, like, um, like being Syrian, for instance. But also we see um, 
you know, the media outlets um, targeting people who are there, who, who they oppose, who, who they oppose. And I, I think this is something that is not recent. This um, has been going on for quite some time. Targeting people based on their addictions, based their, on their political persuasions, um, glue sniffers, um, thieves, thieving tourists, communists, provoking the public, and so on and so forth. We've seen this time and time again in Turkey, and now this has been uh, directed towards the Syrians. And also, we see that, um, of course, there are different media outlets with different political views. And those who, s from those who see themselves in the um, left wing to the most conservative regarding um, refugees, I think they use a similar language. And actually, actually, sadly, um, those who define themselves as religious are actually uh, much perhaps because of the um, because of the fact that they support the, the government they are actually much more moderate compared to left wing press in turkey but of course of course what draws our attention the most is the um, local media because local media um, fans these fears uh, how syrians are causing unemployment um, and so on and so forth. So these local um, media outlets are actually like local merchants. And the discourse that they use is actually quite um, dangerous. And it includes a lot of hate speech, indeed. Let us remember the, uh, as Metin also said, um, uh, he's also involved in um, the research center. Um, and they're running a project. They actually did that project back in January with uh, a journalists association of Turkey. And um, there was an 18-month monitoring report that they, that they shared at that event. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you looked at uh, seven national, seven local um, newspapers and TV channels. And for refugees, um, the, the word runaway is used. Um, and that um, label is used for children as well. And media outlets um, uh, use um, the term, for instance, illegal children or runaway children. And actually, as Bionet, we try to do our best. Of course, uh, we make mistakes from time to time. Um, because of the prevalence of the language, because that prevalent discourse also has an impact on us, but we, also, we do our best to be as responsible as possible. But here's this problem in Turkey. Um, apart from those coming from Europe, uh, Turkey never grants the refugee status to anyone um, um, until these people are sent to third countries, their status is in Turkey temporary protection, those under temporary protection. So until these people go to another country, they are under the status of temporary protection, and they never granted the status of a refugee. But if we claim to be um, rights-based journalists or rights defenders, here's one thing that we need to um, um, be cognizant of in Turkish law, uh, regardless of the status in Turkish law, um, so those uh, coming to Turkey should be called refugees, just like Metin um, has said previously. Um, runaways, runaway immigrants, illegal, unlawful um, immigrants um, are some of the descriptions uh, that um, un unjustly criminalize people. And also asylum seekers, this description, asylum seekers, is also one dimensional in, in, the, in its depiction of, of people. Um, so one more thing that needs to be uh, highlighted is this, I believe. Uh, yes, these people are demonized in, 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 um, in media, but also they're portrayed as mere victims as well. And we see this uh, done through children, especially like um, a baby that's been saved, a child that has been saved from dire conditions, saved by the gendarmerie, saved by the police uh, officers or by um, soldiers. 
and this is something that we need to be careful about as well um, in order not to create a one-dimensional sense of victimhood um, because that could prove detrimental as well thank you thank you very much you have touched upon um, some very important points and I am sure you have done the same of course I'm not going to repeat them one by one right now but um, negative um, journalism has two um, manifestations one has to do with the intent uh, po being politicized and and really truly uh, being against um, immigrants and refugees uh, for personal benefits uh, or personal interest. That's number one. And of course we need to fight that, but that's easier said than done. Uh, Nadia also and Mike also talked about uh, this and they gave us some very good examples. Um, it's very difficult to change the discourse of those with bad intentions. But on the other hand, there are those who don't know enough who are misinformed and um, this is like a chain reaction and that's something that we should perhaps address by teaching people, by um, telling people what is what. And in Turkey as well, there are so many good examples of this. Examples um, that have been given are actually things that we can all benefit from. I come from an NGO background and I have made many notes about the radio, um, joint meetings and so on and so forth. I think these, needs to, these need to be cascaded um, down and disseminated all across the nation. But in Turkey, as uh, Metin said, um, after a media study, in national press um, irregular um, refugees is, is a new description that people use and I think that's more favorable and also uh, a Syrian cyclist um, their success uh, success stories are now featured in the media as well uh, that's also a welcome move and at the end of the project I'm sure your project I mean let us not be pessimistic we run all these um, projects and there are some positive um, outcomes as well so um, these positive results um, are in inspiring are encouraging that's why we need to try and do more I believe